Speaker, but I need to just make a quick note before we um, continue. Let's come back to order. We're discussing three, four, five, six, and seven of Advisory Committee 4C. Uh, I have a queue of speakers. Tim is going to be first, and then Darlene. Uh, Mr. President, uh, but before we do that, I do need to correct one thing uh, that I saw on break, or rather that Kathy Smith helped me with on break. Uh, you as delegates may call the question, there's different language for it, but the language we've been using is you can call the question and then if we vote yes, uh, no new speakers can be added to the queue just as we've been doing. But you are not allowed uh, to cease debate, meaning no more speakers and we vote immediately. Only I can do that as chair. That's our Senate rules. And the term cease debate and call the question is often used interchangeably, but we're going to continue to use it as we've been using it. If you want to make the motion that no more speakers can be added to the list and we'll vote as soon as we get there, make the motion to call the question. We'll vote on it, and if it's approved, we'll st um, stay with our list. But you, as delegates, do not have the authority to cease the debate, meaning no one else gets to speak and we just vote. Is that clear? I just want to be clear because that's a change from what we did just a few uh, moments ago and Kathy Smith helped me with that rule. You have a question? You can always invite me. Um, that will be most amenable to any of your suggestions. Maybe. Um, I, just a couple of Things happened over the break that are minor but need sure. to be there. You, you have the privilege of four and then Tim. Yeah. So thank you for your patience. Um, there, there were a couple of um, hopefully minor but nonetheless important um, uh, friendly amendments that we, uh, we felt were good to include. And so uh, I would turn your attention to item six, uh, item six or recommendation six, uh, that instead um, of what it uh, read uh, just before, it should read that synods celebrate the current culture at the Rehoboth Christian School, Zuni Christian Mission School, and our Aber urban Aboriginal ministries. And the urban Aboriginal ministries, wanting to recognize that there is good First Nations, uh, good work being done among and with uh, First Nations peoples in Canada through urban Aboriginal ministries. And then the second friendly amendment uh, that we that we wanted to note is that in item four. Item four, uh, and they don't have this over there in the projection area, so you're gonna have to listen until they're able to really get it out. Uh, and that is that, um, that Synod recognized, uh, and I'll tell you when the change is coming, that Synod recognized the pain of those who suffered from their experiences in the residential schools of the US and Canada, including Rehoboth Christian School, and then this is the new addition, comma, and lament any of our mistakes that caused pain, period. We considered that a friendly amendment. So that is, and lament any of our mistakes that caused pain. All right, we have heard those, and we will get those uh, corrected and up on the screen just as soon as possible. Tim, you are up to speak, and then Darlene. Thank you, Mr. President. I uh, want to first of all express my appreciation to the advisory committee for changing its report and making number three a little bit more prominent in its uh, thanks. I have a couple stories to tell. Uh, the first is of my great uncle, Ted Toussaint, who was a builder in uh, south side of Chicago and south suburbs of Chicago. In some of my very basic genealogical research, I discovered that I think it was the 1940 census, his address was listed as Rehoboth, New Mexico. I had not heard that particular story, but apparently he went down there to work and serve for a while in doing some building in Rehoboth. The second story is of my uncle, who I had the privilege of visiting on Sunday afternoon in a retirement center in Holland. He, in April, celebrated his 104th birthday. 
and his mind is still absolutely sharp and clear, and he loves to tell stories. Nine of his 104 years were spent in Rehoboth, at Rehoboth Christian School, as well as in Zuni. He uh, went there because he heard God's call in his life. He didn't go there because of a doctrine of discovery or because uh, he devalued some other people. He went there because he believed God called him there. And he loved the Navajo people. That was always evident to us, that he cared very deeply for those people that he taught and served and ministered to. And I think that particular time of, of service and ministry, both of my great uncle and of my uncle and of numerous other people needs to be recognized and thanked and celebrated. And it can't just be uh, ignored because there were mistakes that were made. And there were mistakes that were made. I don't mean to, to indicate that at all, but that commitment needs to be recognized. I also want to make a comment with regard to number four and the idea of the pain and recognizing the pain. What we also need to understand, uh, my uncle, like I said, his mind is clear. He is fully aware of this report that was prepared. That report pained him significantly because in a sense, it demeaned his work and basically said it wasn't right because it was a mistake to have Rehoboth Christian School there. And, and we really don't want to cause somebody else pain as we recognize the pain that one person suffered. So I, I think we need to be very careful with our words and if there are those who experienced pain, because of this report, who served willingly and eagerly, we need to recognize that there's pain there too. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Darlene, and then Phil, and then William. Chair Darlene Lidson, Ethnic Advisor. Um, my experience, we call our boarding school, uh, was very good. I went to two boarding schools. The first one was in Arizona. Uh, it went up to the third grade. So after third grade, there are no other schools around our community. So we went off to, uh, I went to Fort Wingate boarding school. Um, I had a good experience. I wasn't told not to speak my, my language. Nobody cut my hair. Um, so, and I enjoyed school. My parents didn't really have a choice because like I said, there were no other schools surrounding where I live, which is East Husband, Arizona. So, uh, and then we, my parents gave me a choice. You want to go to Rehoboth or for, you know, we were on the list to go to Rehoboth, but then um, I guess it was full. So we ended up going to Fort Wingate. So I, I had good experience. I went to college after high school. And so my, my experience, I was very good. I didn't have any problem. Um, at the boarding school. Now, and my, my sisters went to Rehoboth. I have cousins who went to Rehoboth, my aunts, the rest of the family did. But no, I've talked to them and they, they never uh, admitted to any injustice done and you know. And so that's my story. But also about uh, I believe it was number four there uh, about the missionaries, the Great Commission. Uh, I just want to acknowledge, if I may, Chair, uh, the people I'm 
sorry. I want to acknowledge these people because they were a part of our lives. The Heisingas, the Vanderstoops, the Harberts, the Brummels, the Boyds, the Scripsimas, the Hogsmas, the Vaktavines, the Copes, the Stikes, the Swingas, the Van Brookens, the Camps, the Bohais, the Cruises, the Kloppenhauers, who came out to the Neville Reservation to bring gospel to our communities, and they lived among us. And, and because of them, because they brought gospel, salvation came to my grandparents' house. Salvation came to my mother's house. Salvation came to my house. Salvation came to my children's house my grandchildren, my extended family. So to God be the glory, and I thank, thank God for them. Amen. Um, thank you for your words. Phil and then Joan. Um, yes, Mr. Chairman. Philip Stell from uh, uh, Northern Illinois. I have uh, two questions, and one follows up really on uh, what we just heard. Um, as I read the uh, uh, Doctrine of Discovery report, um, the question is, did the people that the white man met or the Europeans met in uh, North and South America, did they need Jesus? Um, there's a number of things in the report, and I guess I'm looking for an answer to that, because some of the stuff that I, that I read through here, <clears throat> in, it says, uh, you know, it's our hope that our journey would be a seeking of our common history as children of the triune creator. Um, there's um, a Euro superior syncretism has been a block, stumbling block to the message of the gospel to indigenous peoples. The church needs... Uh, honors the fact that God was present in this place before the arrival of the Europeans and uh, the DOCD distorted the gospel and that it rejected the belief that Christ was sovereign among the Navajo and Zuni before the, um, the white man arrived and um, so there's a and then the in my dream a Navajo medicine man came to my Hogan I recognize that Jesus was the Navajo medicine man visiting me. Uh, he came in and went to the West. And, and, and so I, I, my first question is, when we wanted to come to, uh, to the, the native peoples, uh, did we, are we saying that they did not need Jesus? Or, or what are we? I'm, I'm just a little confused by the the way that I read that in the report. I, I think um, that you are, um, with all due respect, um, to ask the question, did they need Jesus? Um, well, on the surface, it, it seems like a perfectly legitimate question, and it is. Uh, it certainly runs the risk of oversimplifying things quite, quite extremely. Uh, because, of course, they needed Jesus. Absolutely. Uh, everybody uh, needs Jesus. That's not the issue at question here. Uh, the issue is that, uh, sadly, in uh, European countries, and this could happen anywhere to any people group, um, Christian theology, uh, Jesus, uh, was sadly packaged with uh, doctrines and practices that were profoundly not of Jesus. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission in Canada has recognized that actions that flowed out of the doctrine of discovery resulted in things like the residential school programs in Canada, which were, uh, which were said to be basically, in effect, cultural genocide. Um, that is profoundly not something of Jesus. And so 
of course, of course they needed Jesus. Um, that's not the question. The question is, uh, the question is more having to do with what was brought along with Jesus um, that was of a sinful nature and that caused tremendous hurt and harm. I appreciate that uh, clarification. Uh, my second question um, is what does the, was resolution or what does shalom look like? The, the blanket exercise I thought was a powerful visual and visceral uh, experience um, and exercise, you know, and we, out of that we feel, we have strong feelings of, say, guilt and anger and sadness and, and sorry. Um, but what, what is the, the vision, the, the dream, the, the shalom look like when we get through this? I, I, I read the last of the, you know, where are we here? My screen went blank. I think it was number seven where um, it says, Synod direct the executive director to work with the appropriate agencies and offices in committing the CRC to walk alongside affected parties, listen to their stories, lament, weep with them, until such time as we can walk in beauty together, and that's a poetic uh, phrase there. Uh, I'm wondering what, what, what are we envisioning? Um, the, 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 the residential schools and, and all of the rest that we're talking about were very flawed um, attempts, it seemed to me, at, well, as we talked about assimilation, right, bringing the, the Native people into our mainstream, and, and, and we, we created that. But um, so what is the, the goal that we have in mind? What does it look like? I'm not clear on that. If it's not kind of assimilation into the mainstream, just to dare to say that, what does it look like? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, and if it's okay, I'd like to invite uh, Darren Rorda um, to speak a little bit uh, about that. Um, part of this is rooted in not wanting to define for people uh, what the outcomes are or will be or even necessarily how the process is going to happen. Uh, but Darren also has some, uh, some, some more fleshing out that he can share with us, I believe. Darren Rorta, a Canadian Ministries person. Uh, there's a couple dynamics going on on the floor that speak to how to answer this question. And they both around, revolve around one issue, and that's trust. When uh, Recommendation 7 suggests very generally, which is what our advisory committee had hoped to do, that Synod direct the executive director to work with the appropriate agencies and offices in committing the CRC to walk alongside affected parties, listen to their stories, lament and weep, and so on. We are honoring and trusting that the Aboriginal community that we are so desirous of serving and to work with will be able to indicate to us what would work best. And in the tension that existed between the great parts of what Rehoboth was about and the worst parts of what the doctrine of discovery brought with it, there, is, there was conversation at the advisory committee level that said it's too early to define exactly the methods by which this happens until that conversation gets graciously sorted out amongst those people with whom it's most important. And here's where the second part of trust is. Synod, in some great way, over the course of four days, by virtue of its experience in its Christian Reformed Church ministry, I think appropriately needs to build a trust with the staff of the Christian Reformed Church, of which I am one now. And you label, in a recommendation like this, a moderator or mediator to who's going to work with the parties involved, the executive director. That just means he'll watch over the staff and will trust them in such a way that all of the most significant parties involved in this tender subject will do the good work of defining in the very near future what those steps would look like. And to do something 
different, our advisory committee felt, would be to act in a way that would not honor all of the parties involved, whether it's Rehoboth and all of us cheering for the good work of the gospel that was done, or whether it's those individuals or people who were hurt in some way, whether they belong to a Christian Reformed Church in Regina, or whether they happen to be part of the Rehoboth Christian School. That work needs to happen broadly, and we have responsible and capable people in the Christian Reformed Church who I think can actually make it happen in a way that would uh, roll out very well. Uh, some of the practices are defined in the task force's report. They may very well be included. It wouldn't surprise me one bit if they were. But our advisory, advisory committee felt it would be best for the sake of our discussion here not to fight over fight, not to speak over specifics, but to leave it general and trust that good work was going to happen by all of those folks. Thank you. You wish to speak, Mike? Please. Thank you. Um, thank you for the question. Um, a frequent question when one does the blanket exercise around the country is, what's next? How can we fix this? And I urge you as a body to resist that temptation. The trail of colonialism is at least 500 years old, if not 15 or 1600 years old. And its legacy is a long one and we can't fix it overnight or even in a generation. But the journey begins in relationships with our indigenous sisters and brothers by learning the fullness of their stories. We've heard good ones on the floor. There are hard ones in the report and we know there are more. We need to honor those stories. We need to lament. And then together, over the long term, perhaps a generation or two, come into a path of relationship where we honor the fullness of the gifts that Indigenous people bring to the church and to our societies. There is much there that's been not heard, rich gifts that can bring us over a long term into that path of shalom that the brother mentioned. Joan, and then Paul. Joan DeVries, Classes Toronto. Um, I have submitted an amendment, Mr. Chair, that I hope will be a friendly amendment, um, because barring that, no, it's on number three. Okay. <laughs> um, barring that, I'm finding some inequality in this report. Uh, the, the committee's mandate was to deal with the doctrine of discovery and its consequences. Uh, it seems to me that is what they did, and they showed us the consequences of the doctrine of discovery also within our own denomination. And so we, in number two, affirmed, acknowledged that it, it is a false doctrine. Um, and then we give much more text to number three, which is recognizing the gospel motivation. Uh, so, so it's as if we, we, are, we give very little space to how bad the doctrine of discovery was. And then now we have to justify ourselves and say, well, the co there was gospel motivation and that that was a great thing and so I have an amendment to change some of that language not to take it away I'm waiting for it to come up and this is to number three yes because ours says proposed recommendation c4 you yes. mean it to and apply? that that was incorrect and I have corrected that okay. with the, so c3 all right so um I have proposed not very big words, but it, 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 it changes a little bit, I think, uh, going from one to the other. So it says that synod nevertheless recognize also the gospel motivation. Um, otherwise, I am afraid when you go from number two to number three, it's as if you're dismissing number two. We'll just state it, and then it's over, and now we're going on to the good stuff. And also, it does not recognize that the Great Commission, as we call it, was entwined with the doctrine of discovery. They're not 
two separate things. And the advisory committee is not recognizing that, that they came and twined and packaged together with each other. So I, I want to uh, recommend this amendment um, to, to make that flow a little better. Essentially, it's adding the word nevertheless and also, right. correct? All right. What does the committee think? Uh, we would consider that friendly. All right, so now it reads that Senate nevertheless recognize also, and then it goes on as it was. Thank you, Joan. Paul. Nope, off the list, and then Stephen. And after Steve, Richard. Rick. Steve Vanderlees, class of Thorn Apple Valley. Mr. President, I respectfully call the question. Question has been called. All in favor of calling the question say aye. aye. Any opposed? That motion carries. We'll keep those that we have on the list, starting with Rick and then Melissa. Mr. Speaker, uh, Rick Admiral, class of Central Plains. And I remember my time at Rehoboth. It was in the late 80s and early 90s. I was a high school math teacher at the time. And my wife, Rose, was an elementary school teacher there. And I, I have many fond memories of that place. And I know that a lot of the people there showed a lot of love. Um, uh, in fact, in reading the Doctrine of Discovery myself, um, I found myself getting defensive at times because um, in my memory of my time at that place, I still feel so much love for Rehoboth and so much love for the Navajo people and so much love for the Zuni people. And so I want to commend the advisory committee for um, bringing a word of redemptive history to the equation, uh, for showing that there is grace on the other side of sin, that there is healing on the other side of brokenness, and there is a phoenix rising from the ashes. And for that, I give thanks to God. Thank you. Melissa? There you go. Melissa Van Dyke, woman advisor. I had the opportunity to attend the Canadian Truth and Reconciliation Commission twice, both in Victoria and Vancouver, British Columbia. There I heard firsthand the truths shared by residential school survivors and their relatives. I currently work in the downtown east side of Vancouver, an area of town that has a high population of marginalized people and a disproportionate number of indigenous people. While I recognize that I speak from a place of privilege, in my work context, I witness daily the implications of residential schools and the attempt of our government to, and I quote, get the Indian out of the child. Reading the Doctrine of Discovery Task Force report, I saw an expressed a desire for us as a collective body of congregations and as individual communities to recognize the deep roots and implications of the systemic injustice we have been part of, not only as it relates to our role at Rehoboth, but also as those who live in communities with Indigenous neighbours, which we all have, whether or not we have taken the time to get to know them or not. In my opinion, the advisory committee does not go far enough in acknowledging our ongoing personal and congregational response or our need for repentance. Repentance actually isn't mentioned in any of the recommendations. We did just change number four to say lament, but to lament is different than to repent. In number seven, we talk about walking alongside and weeping with them, which seems to indicate that, again, we are doing this for them, which really, we need to do something. We cannot change history, and we do want to look to the future, but to do that well, we do need to own the cultural genocide that we have been part of and the prejudice that we continue to be part of. Thank you. Did Eric still want to speak, or did you take your name off? Removed. May I respond to that quickly? Yes, you, you certainly may. Um, the word um, repent uh, is not... Um, there is a reason that it's, it's not really there, and, and that is because in consultation with the task force writers uh, and with Rehoboth, um, something that Mike alluded to earlier uh, was, came to our hearts, and, and that is that in order to repent, you first need to 
spend some time weeping and lamenting in order for the repentance to truly mean something. Um, it was suggested to us that sometimes uh, people in the dominant culture um, have a tendency to repent um, a little bit too quickly um, and it comes across sometimes as, as flippant. And uh, we did not want to do that at all. Uh, we did not want to be uh, flippant in that. Thank you. William and then Gail. William Delaman, Class Selburn and North. Mr. Chairman, the first uh, university class I took, I was an adult, I was about 34 years old, and it was the history of British Columbia. And it was, that was the moment when I learned how um, the first settlers made agreements, treaties, with Aboriginal people and had never completely lived up to those uh, agreements, those covenants. And I began to realize that as a Canadian citizen, I was responsible in some way. And I began to think about how I referred to an Indigenous person, their work ethic, their uh, character, their social problems. And I realized that I was very much formed by this doctrine, this environment. I was very conditioned by a culture that did not view Indigenous people as those made in the image of God. That was some time ago, and I have been on a journey, and I would like to thank both the task force and the advisory committee for including the word lament, because I have learned to lament more and more my responsibility in this. I have learned that lament does not allow me to overfocus on the past, as I heard earlier, and I agree, we cannot change the past, but I believe that lament will shape us toward a much better future, a future where we can indeed see each other as God's children and God's family together. So I support this motion, and I again thank the work of the committee and the advisory committee. Gail, and then James. Forgive me for speaking yet again. I was, I was saving myself for this, okay? <laughs> um, I have been listening over and over. I have not spoken up until this point, but I've listened to the um, passion pleas of my African-American sisters yesterday. I've listened to our first clerk talk about taking the Belhar Confession and putting it on a shelf somewhere. I've listened to my Native American brothers and sisters as they talk about the disparages between the beauty that surrounds us here and what we live with in New Mexico, one of the very poorest counties in all of the United States. And as I listened, I believe that the Lord gave me something that if we could commit to, Mr. Chairman, as a synod would define the first step toward changing what is going on. And so I humbly submit an amendment for you to consider as part of this process that we have gone through as we've talked about the, the um, evils of racism and prejudice and discrimination. And I invite you to look at this amendment and consider it at this time. Um, the question's been called. You cannot make an amendment after the question's been called. Even though I was in the queue? Even though you um, were in the queue. Can I make a motion? No? No, nothing? we have okay. to proceed okay. to vote on the motion. Okay. James? No? Beatrice? Sorry? Yeah, the President, or the Chair, 
um, I'm born for, uh, my clan is I'm born for Donald Trump Tower, you know, that, build, that building that uh, <laughs> Trump has. And then I have an oceanfront property too. So that's uh, born, born for uh, Totsoni. And that, that's, my, uh, that's my clan. It's, it's, we always introduce ourselves or who, what clan we belong to in, in our Navajo way of life, you know. So but that's who I am. And uh, I really don't have an oceanfront property or Donald Trump Tower or anything like that. But that's the way it's described is Kia'an, it's a tall building. And then uh, Big Water clan. So, I'm born for them, and uh, that, that's why I always introduce myself as that. <laughs> but anyway, um, I just want to back up my, my wife here, that what she spoke about, who all uh, were people that brought the gospel to, to Rehoboth. And uh, now, let me tell you my side of the story that I went to Fort Wingate to boarding school that's about 11 miles away from uh, Rehoboth. But anyway, they also had a, had a, a, a bomb shelter there that, that, that if, if Russia should attack, we were the first choice to hit, hit those places. So we were always warned that, you know, but in case of attack, and I'm also a veteran, you know, I'm, uh, I volunteered for Vietnam, but they never sent me back over there, so. Uh, I did parachuting and, and, and the, 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 the stuff that goes with uh, being in, in the army. And uh, I learned discipline from there too. So that's what the, the government gave me. And the, the main thing that I want to stress here is that uh, uh, if it wasn't for, for the gospel coming to the United States, uh, I wouldn't be standing here. I, I would have been somewhere on the street in Gallup or somewhere. Uh, but the thing is that uh, what happened was when, when, when I finished sixth, sixth grade, fifth grade over in, in the Chin Lee boarding school, uh, I was supposed to go to Phoenix. I wanted a volunteer to go to Phoenix. That was my first choice. And then my second choice was Wingate, but I missed the bus to, to Phoenix. And I ended up going to Wingate, and that's where I met my wife. And she was already a Christian. And uh, through that, after being married to her for 31 years, I finally accepted Christ. And this is where I cry, because I wouldn't have known the Lord. If it didn't go that way, and I'm so glad that I missed that bus. <laughs> That's my story, and God bless you all. You are brothers and sisters now. Thank you, James. Beatrice. B. Wallace from Eastern Canada. I want to thank the committee for their work. I am saddened that there's not as much Canadian content. I would like to address my native brother, who I spoke with in the dining hall the other day, and say now I understand what lament means, that it's not just going to repentance. I lament that in my country, we have so many missing Native women that they don't know where they are, who's murdered them, where they've been buried, and families are weeping and mourning. And I have to now admit, I was Canadian and I'm not a racist, but I think as a country, we have been racist with our Native people. We have done exactly what the blanket exercise has said and has shown me. And we are still suffering the consequences. Our native people are suffering badly. 
We have, and you may not know this because it maybe doesn't get down here to the United States, but we have a small community in Northern Ontario who is fighting and suffering the indignities because they're, because of what's happened over a century ago, they have all these young people trying to commit suicide in suicide packs, and they keep sending people up to help, and more and more are trying to commit suicide because of what we, as a wonderful Northern European people, have done to them. So that is my apology to the natives, as best as I can say it. Thank you. We have the motion in front of us now. We have no more speakers on our list. It is three, four, five, six, and seven. Are we ready to vote? All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. We move on then to recommendation eight. And that is that Synod affirm initial actions for justice and reconciliation of the CRC in Canada that are already in process. Namely, A, the public acknowledgement of systemic evils behind colonialism, the confession of the CRC's sins of assimilation and paternalism, and the commitment to live into a sacred call of unity and reconciliation as expressed to the Truth and Reconciliation Committee, Committee Commission excuse me, of Canada, and B, follow-up initiatives on the calls to action of the TRC. So moved. All right, we'll accept that, but since it's the CRC in Canada, you have to say process. <laughs> My mother was born in New Jersey, so I get to say it whichever way um. I want. <laughs> Very good. Number eight is before us. Would you like to speak to it, Mike? So as has been intoned numerous times uh, over the last several hours, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission process of, of hearings over the course of the last seven years has been a sacred process. Got it right. a sacred process in which uh, many uh, of our parishioners have participated. We've heard stories, uh, we've honored those stories, and they've been difficult. To a person, I've heard from indigenous people who've gone through that process, who've called it uh, a sacred blessing to them, one that's affirmed their truth, and one that moves us as a nation to a, a place of healing. We mentioned on Saturday, Saturday was the eighth anniversary of Prime Minister Stephen Harper standing in the House of Commons and offering an apology to survivors of residential schools. As has been intoned on this floor just recently, apologies are not enough, but our consistent actions and listening and walking in relationship and to borrow a phrase from my Navajo sisters and brothers walking in beauty, that that's imperative. I have a dear friend and mentor who's an indigenous theologian, actually more than just one. One of them once sat in a room with some of us at Harold Rocher's place in Edmonton and said to us, you know what, you CRC folks have beautiful theology, but you're just like any church. You have a beautiful articulated theology and sometimes not a lived theology. So the Truth and Reconciliation Commission has offered us an exquisite gift of coming to understand how we can live into a theology of reconciliation and healing. So it's been an honor numerous times to participate in national events where statements have been made and you see some reference to the, uh, some of those statements there. But more importantly, uh, it's critical that we lean into follow-up to the calls to action of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And I'm honored to tell you that the Canadian Aboriginal Ministries Committee 
and the Center for Public Dialogue have a, a, a formal plan uh, to lean into specific recommendations, particularly around the building of relationships, the continuing of educational and awareness initiatives, and honoring uh, particularly calls to actions number seven through 10, which talk about reconciliation in Indigenous education, particularly by bringing justice to that system within Canada. I'll just name those things uh, so that this is less abstract for you. Uh, some of these details are in, uh, available uh, in the, the, the grounds uh, of the recommendations in the report in number F. Thank you. Hendrik. I have a lot of respect for what our uh, denominational leaders have done in this field. They have gained a great deal of respect um, in our country of Canada. Um, it is significant that um, when the public ceremonies came in Ottawa, when the Truth and Reconciliation Report uh, became public, the CRC was requested by a lot of Canadian Aboriginal groups to re represent the Protestant side of things because of the good work done in many different fronts. Um, so I, I think this is entirely right that Synod affirm the actions, uh, affirm initial actions for justice and reconciliation because there have been many and they are to be applauded. Um, at the same time though, I would like to put a little caveat in there in that there is a trust that we need to have but that trust goes both ways. And that sometimes in certain actions, there ought to be ways to consult the membership of the CRC when our leadership takes some actions. And there was, for example, a United States Declaration, I mean, United Nations Declaration on Aboriginal Freedoms, um, which was a significant document that has significant meaning for what we as a country may do a lot of countries signed that thing. Uh, Brazil signed it and never wanted to bother keeping it. Um, United States, Canada, uh, Australia, and New Zealand, for many different reasons, thought it was not wise, even if we wanted to uh, work with our Aboriginal peoples. And I had that same hesitation, personally, whether we as a country, Canada, should sign that United States doctrine, uh, United Nations doc, uh, doc, doctrine. Um, and Suddenly I found, oh, our CRC has told the Canadian government they should adopt it. And I thought, hmm, okay, maybe. Uh, but I, I wonder if our American uh, part of the CRC would want the American government to, to adopt that. And so at some point, that trust is there, and I admire what our leaders have done, but at some point, a little bit more consultation might be in order to say, did the CRC the whole, all the people of the CRC in, in, Ontario, in Canada really take that particular action because it was a very significant one. Thank you. I believe Mike would like to speak to that. Uh, thank you for that uh, drawing to attention, I suppose. Uh, the uh, call to action to which the brother has spoken uh, is, is Truth and Reconciliation Commission call to action 48 which affirms and encourages church communities to affirm the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples as a framework for reconciliation. Canada has indeed affirmed that declaration quite recently, uh, uh, more robustly on the floor of the UN. Um, so Canadian objections to it are uh, no longer there. Uh, so that's, that's a, a positive and important thing to note. In terms of processing, uh, this work has been done, uh, unfortunately, under a very tight timeline. Um, as, as, uh, as we've said to the Truth and Reconciliation Commissioners, uh, perhaps you know the church moves slowly. Uh, the, the commission asked churches to, to make that declaration um, last June and then uh, set a deadline of 31 March. So with uh, the, the support uh, and deliberation of the Committee for Contact with Government, which is a national body, Canadian Aboriginal Ministries Committee, which is a national body, 
and in a deliberation with the CRCNA Canada Corporation and ultimately the Board of Trustees, a position statement affirming that declaration as a call to reconciliation was made. For your information. Gina. Gina Taylor, Clauses Hamilton. My question, having read the Doctrine of Discovery Task Force report, Mr. Chairman, what specifically are we alleging? Are the CRCs as a, as a bodies particular sins of assimilation and, and paternalism? And I don't mean to be facetious. I don't understand specifically what our denomination itself is apologizing for in Canada. I'm gonna defer to Mike again. Uh, That's, that's a, a significant question. Uh, in, in terms of uh, the way I'd answer it uh, would be to, to say uh, the colonial project in Canada uh, has a legacy uh, for each one of us. And uh, recognizing that the journey of reconciliation is one that, that calls the entire church, uh, that we need to recognize that the corporate sins of our nation are things that we also own. Thank you. I see no further speakers. Are we ready to vote on this motion? All in favor of motion eight, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Moving on then to uh, motion or recommendation number nine, that Synod declare this to be our response to the Doctrine of Discovery Task Force Report, Overture 14 and Communications 1 and 2. So moved. Motion's made. It's on the floor. Do I see a speaker? Gail. There's always, if there's a will, there's a way here. <laughs> so we're going to try to bring that amendment that I... Um, would like Mr. Chairman to bring before the Senate. Okay, do we have an amendment from Gail? Or an additional recommendation? All right, for an additional recommendation. When did you send it in, Gail? Um, when we were talking about same sex issues. She had, she had it up before. It was part of number seven, but I wrote you and asked to change it to number nine. All right, we got a paper copy at least. Do you want me to read it, Mr. Chairman? Yes, would you please read it while we're getting it up electronically? That would be very helpful to us. Oh, there it is. Okay. And this should say recommendation number nine that Synod direct the executive director, working in conjunction with denominational agencies, to create a denomination-wide annual day of justice for the purpose of coming together as a body of Christ to recognize the plight of those who are oppressed, marginalized, and suffer in a culture of discrimination. In this day, people of the Christian Reformed Church would come together to confess lament, listen to the stories of those who have experienced pain at the hands of others, read the Belhar Confession, and then to open the doors to promoting just solutions to the problems created by the evils of racism. Through this day of justice, we would, as the body of Christ, resolve to transform our world, seek to change hearts through Christ's redeeming love, and promote the welfare of our brothers and sisters who cry out for justice. All right, I think, um, I think the best way to do that, um, we, you know, the motion on the floor is that uh, we declare this our response. You're essentially wanting to slide this new recommendation in before we get to that, correct? correct. So you will need to make a motion to table, and then you will need to move this recommendation. That's how you would go about that. Okay, so moved. I would like to do that. 
Mr. Sheehy. I would it, like to table the overture, our response to the overture. To go to this. To so the, the motion is made to table, and I think I heard a support. All right, that motion to table is before us, and you all understand the intent. If you're interested in talking about this before we vote on the previous motion, you, you're going to vote to table. If not, uh, you'll vote no. All in favor of tabling, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Um, we better vote electronically. That was too close for me to call. It's up and running. Please remember a yes vote means that we'll table the motion to consider the motion she was just showing us on the screen. A vote no means that we'll go right to voting on the motion before us. We have uh, voted to table the motion. It is tabled. Could you please, uh, Gail, um, get up and officially move your suggested motion? Now that we've tabled the motion on the floor, we're open to receive Gail's motion. I move to accept this recommendation. And that would become number nine for us. Thank you, Gail. Is that supported? All right, the motion is in front of us. Joel? Joel Zaitan, my class is Ileana. Um, Mr. Chairman, I would ask that Gail would step back to the microphone. Give us some more from her heart. She's a peacemaker. She's been, she's been living in, her context as a peacemaker. I'd like to hear more about this motion. We have lots of days of in the denomination, and uh, maybe we need another one, but I'd like to know a little more from her heart, if you are so inclined. Please. Thank you, Joel. This motion does come from a heart that has seen great injustice. I have worked amongst African American people in Cary, Mississippi. I have worked for most of my life amongst Native American people. And I don't think we truly understand the, the problems of being an oppressed people. We do not have economic leaders. We do not have people who have sympathy and an economic base for the people who suffer. I was talking with one of my um, table mates who said, I didn't even know there were Native American people in my state. These are forgotten people. And Mr. Chairman, we have had so many divisive issues before us. Is this one that we can come together and say, let us unify behind the cause of Christ, behind the cause of recognizing injustice and answering it. 
my, um, one of my faculty advisors said, you know, maybe we should suggest that this day take place on the Sunday before Synod. <laughs> Interesting thought, huh? But maybe that would hold us to all of our talk about how we want change. And maybe that would hold us to striving to make a difference for the cause of Christ. Thank you. I have Chris and Chris Schoon. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Chris Schoon, Classes Hamilton. Um, I love the concept and the idea of this. I'm concerned that we're making a proposal on something that will be an annual day without including the cost implications or the employee staff implications uh, in the context of other ministries. Um, I love the idea. I think we need more time to develop it into something that could be responded to well by everybody. Okay, Andrew, and then Anthony. Yeah, I, uh, I'm Andrew Elkema from, I guess, the territorial uh, grounds of the Clately Tene people in what is now called British Columbia in the northern part. Um, I, I speak against this recommendation, which, which sounds like an awful thing to do. Um, we do have a Race Relations Sunday in our calendar. There is an uh, Aboriginals um, in Group Sunday. Uh, so, we, so we have some of these things. So uh, to do this wouldn't take anything more than just kind of instructing, writing a letter to uh, the Office for Social Justice and these organizations to create some kind of litany for those Sundays. So uh, we don't need to recreate the wheel. So I speak against it. Anthony. Anthony and then Ken. Ken. And then Lenore. President, I'm looking at uh, Ken Baker, Kalamazoo. I'm looking at the second line, the word create. And I wonder if it could be considered a friendly amendment to substitute for create, consider. I would love to see the executive director, perhaps via the BOT, consider such a day. Because that consideration could lead to a report that comes to Synod next year, kind of clarifying further what this could look like. Uh, maybe there's other ways to address it. Uh, I would welcome that kind of considered uh, reflection on this rather than instruct to create. Consider. Consider instead of create, Gail, is that friendly? We know Ken's friendly, but is that a friendly amendment? I would accept that. Thank you, Gail. Okay, we're going to insert consider instead of create. Thank you, Lenore. And then Kari. Lenore Main, classes Hackensack. Um, I'm in favor of this. Um, I was reading as you were talking about the doctrine, and I was just looking it up to see where, what it is that I don't know about it. And there's a lot that I don't, and I'm glad that you would be doing this because this would be a day for us to help teach our congregation about the doctrine of discovery so that we can talk about the Catholic Church and the three doctrines that started slavery, that took land from the natives, from, the, from American natives, from natives from every, from, from Australia to wherever Europeans went. They were given the authority by the church to go out and do this. And mm -hmm. I think in the churches where we would have a good time going back, looking at it, and asking for forgiveness for what part we played in it and asking for um, just a, an, an opportunity to be able to move forward, but move forward as a church. And what better place to do it but in your home church where you know everyone and you can talk more openly. So I'm in favor of this motion. Thank you, Lenore. Kari. Uh, I will speak neither in favor or against. Um, simply, I would like us to consider um, changing the, well, I would like us to consider as we deliberate, um, is this issue of day of justice, um, was meant to be denomination wide, um, should it be limited to racism? 
um, that's just worth us thinking about. Okay, we're thinking about, thank you, Kari. Eric, and then Joan. Oh, Eric's off. Joan, and then Gary. Joan DeVries, Classes Toronto. Um, I was going to vote against it as it was up there. Um, with the amendment, it's a little more friendly, but I want to remind us that we already, at least in Canada, have several Sundays in June, one where we have collections for Aboriginal ministries, after that, Office of Social Justice, and then in October, Race Relations, and if you are wise in your congregation, you use these Sundays um, to highlight these things and have litanies and perhaps even preach on topics around that. Gary and then Andrew. Nope, Andrew's off. Gary and then Nathan. Gary Seitzma, Classes uh, Hamilton. I know what we're trying to do through this uh, motion and um, I have no uh, problem with the intent, but could, uh, could they talk to us about what that hopefully looks like in the local church? Like what the intent is there, what, what, like what we're trying to do or what we're trying to get the local church to do in response to something like this? Well, as I understand it, that is something we as a denomination would need to develop and figure out. We're really just asking the denomination to help us consider a, a, a process of doing just that. I'm not sure anyone could speak with absolute certainty as to what that would look like. No, but like my point is that oftentimes we're, we're doing something, but we give no further instruction to the local church. And the local churches, that's where the rubber hits the road. That's where we want the action. Right. Nathan. Nathan Weiford, Pacific Northwest. I'd like to speak in favor of the motion. I think it's also a good solution to what we were talking about with the Belhar. It's a good way to use it without making it a full confession. Um, that's all I have to say. We have no more speakers. Are we ready to vote? All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. That motion carries. Now, Gail, you go home and you tell everyone that you made a motion on the floor of Senate <laughs> and snip, snip, dip, we voted on it and approved it, all right? I'm not sure your, your comments are in order. Sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt, no doubt. I've done it before, I'll do it again. No. Uh, I think we're moving on to recommendation uh, nine, now 10, I yes, guess. Yes, that's correct. Okay, so recommendation 10, that Synod declare this to be our response to the Doctrine of Discovery Task Force Report, Overture 14 and Communications 1 and 2, so moved again. All right, it's moved and it's supported. It's in front of us. Any conversation? I do have some speakers. They got on before the motion. Did you want to speak to this? Who, who said yep? And, go ahead, Ant. We have Andrew and then uh, Joseph. Yeah, I know this is a bit of a, a, a weird one to uh, speak to, uh, an odd motion to speak to. Hey, thanks. I was just grabbing the wrong part. Thanks, Derek. Yeah. Um, but I'm just wondering how this actually functions as a, a response to the task force. So what, what do we do with the task force report after this? Are we... Uh, receiving it for information? Are we rejecting it? Are we sending it back for edits because we just made recommendations that actually have say things different than what the report says? So more of a point of clarification. What, I, what, I, actually, what do I we do with I think this is pretty standard synodical language for when an advisory committee has processed a report. Everything that we've done so far this afternoon is our response. It's also true, is it not, that these task force um, 
reports or study committee reports are automatically received for information, uh, so they're already there. Mm -hmm. And Joe. Yeah. Joe Campis, Classes Red Mesa. I actually probably wanted to speak to the next motion, but this one does apply as well. Uh, I want to uh, thank all those involved in this. Um, my brothers and sisters in Classes Red Mesa have recently joined them, and so uh, they don't know my story, and I'm still learning their story. And uh, they've been very gracious to me in many different ways. And I think also those on the task force have been uh, very gracious as well. Uh, I know four people on the task force. I've met them at different times. Uh, Mark Charles was the first one I met. I met Mark uh, about seven years ago when we both started on boards. I'm on the board of World Missions. He's on the board of trustees, or was on the board of trustees at that time. We were both coming on, learning what this was going to be all about, and met each other at lunch that day, and have continued our relationship since then. I think uh, Steve Cavetu, I've known him as part of World Missions when he came over uh, from being part of, uh, I believe it was the Office of Race Relations in Canada, and became the Canadian Director of World Missions, and uh, has served well on this committee. Um, I met Mike Hogaterp May 1st of this year, when I was invited to preach at Barhaven Fellowship Christian Reform Church on behalf of Christian Reform World Missions. And then I met Harold Roche uh, just a few days ago um, here at, uh, at Synod. And every single person has been gracious in listening, in being part of the process, and uh, seeing this go through. Um, a lot of the work that was done by this advisory committee I appreciate as well. Um, these things were done in collaboration. They were done uh, by consensus building. And I think it would be fair to say that none of the parties involved are 100% happy about what we came up with, but everyone finds them acceptable. And for that, I appreciate that kind of uh, partnership and that kind of working together. And uh, it is the way things should be done in the body of Christ. Thank you. Thank you. We have no more speakers. Are we ready to vote? All in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, that motion carries. Moving on to uh, number recommendation 11 now, I guess, that Synod dismiss the Doctrine of Discovery Task Force with thanks. Um, that is so moved. And so, so moved, we've already been talking about it a little bit. Andrew? Chairman Andrew Elkema from the traditional grounds of the Clayley Tanay people. Um, I, once again, a bit of an odd one to do, but uh, Joe just said that not everyone's happy. I'm going to try to make everyone happy uh, by an amendment that I submitted earlier this afternoon to this one. And we'll find out, I think, quickly if it, if it holds ground or not. Um, so we can probably get that amendment up. <clears throat> so you're suggesting that that Senate dismiss the Doctrine of Discovery Task Force with thanks and then a new sentence, the executive director will provide Senate with an update at Senate 2000. No, that was an amendment that I sent in for number seven earlier, uh, but which they called the question, and so I, I, that one got wiped out. But so just read what you... Yeah, you're... this is what I got. I said that Senate recommit the Doctrine of Discovery Task Force uh, with the consultation of a Canadian and American historian in Aboriginal Studies to resubmit... We, we've, already, we've already declared our response to that committee. We can't recommit to the committee after we've already given a response. What are we recommitting? Uh, well, what we've done is we've just made, we have a report that says one thing, uh, that it was wrong to set up the boarding schools, uh, and we lament, and then we just made recommendations that say something else. So I'm wondering if we can get this to, to kind of mesh together. Okay. No, we cannot. Okay. And the reason I'll is we've away. already acted on it. Okay. Sorry. At, at least that's what I'm going to rule. Fair 
So the motion before us that Senate dismiss the Doctrine of Discovery Task Force with thanks. I see no speakers. Are we ready to vote? All in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, that motion carries. I'm wondering if we can um, pause just a moment before we recite from the Heidelberg Catechism, which I assume no one will try to amend. <laughs> um, but one never knows. <laughs> Um, since that sort of moves us in a new direction, uh, a suggestion uh, came from someone, and I just spoke to Mike about it. It's a little awkward in this room, but here's what we're going to try to do. We want to end uh, in a time of prayer. Uh, as the note says, um, often Native people will talk about widening the circle, meaning, you know, we belong. There's always room for more. I want us to stand and stretch our legs uh, here in the FAC, or the CFAC as I think it's now called, and we're going to try to get in our best semblance of a circle. Now that's going to have to be multi-layered, I recognize, um, but get in our best semblance of a circle. Uh, we can hold hands or whatever you like, and then Harold, if Harold's going to come to the mic at the speaker's platform and lead us uh, in a prayer. Give us just a little bit of time to get in something that looks like a circle. You absolutely may. Great job today. Actually, the whole process was good. good. Yeah, I think that's the best we're going to get, this space. So you put your left foot in, <laughs> shake it all about. No. The circle for us as Indigenous people is important. You stand shoulder to shoulder, hand in hand with your neighbors and friends, brothers and sisters. It affirms our humanity. It's good to feel the touch of another hand in yours. It affirms who you are as a created image bearer of God. And uh, it's been a tough journey this afternoon, so I think we all just need to be affirmed that we are image bearers of the one and only God. Let's pray. Creator, triune creator, we come and we give thanks for the gift of this day. We thank you again for your light that rose in the east, that from the very inception of this world of your creation filled every nook and cranny. Let us be full of that light today as we leave this place, as we go into our neighborhoods, our communities, wherever we might go, that your light would be reflected brightly. As we've heard where it doesn't shine so brightly, help us to find ways to let it out. To be the salt in this earth to be the leaven within the bread. So that again, not our glory, but your glory would be put forth. I thank you for the brothers and sisters in this circle who bring honor to the process. And we just wanna honor those stories that are outside of this building right now that we're not sure of and how we're gonna gather all of them, um, but they're important to your narrative. Help us to remind us that we're still part of that story and as we journey together, you continue to bless our footsteps. So that when we get to our journey, we'll be able to see with straight eyes and know in our hearts that you live. So bless this day, bless our journey forward. Hi, hi. Amen. Thank you, everyone. You can uh, return to your places. We might be standing again in just a moment, but uh, please return to your places to do that. Do we have this in a liturgy form or is it going to be able to come up on the screen? We should be able to get it up on the screen.
used it. All right, folks, let's come to order. Let's come to order now. We have a couple more recommendations from this committee that we want to continue with. Mr. Uh, President, we, uh, we actually have a whole nother report for later. I'm very happy for that, Daniel. <laughs> I'm sure you are. Uh, brothers and sisters, we have a recommendation that I'm going to bring in just a moment. Um, and I want to frame it just for a second. Uh, a long time ago, uh, not in a galaxy far, far away, but in Canada, uh, a classist put together an overture that Synod reaffirm our commitment to love all people by standing and reciting together the Heidelberg Catechism, Lord's Day 40. And they did not know at that time about incidents like what happened in Orlando, where gay and lesbian people were gunned down because of their sexual orientation. They did not realize, perhaps, that we are going to have some of the discussions that we have had regarding race, the Belhar, culture, privilege. Nor did they realize, probably in the fullness that we realize now, that we would have such in-depth and difficult discussions about the doctrine of discovery and about human sexuality. And so we bring this recommendation in the hopes that whatever side of the theological fence we sit on, whatever side of culture we sit on, whatever side of races or creeds, that we will be able to affirm 100% along with the Heidelberg Catechism that God has called us to love, to love him with our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. And so I move that Synod reaffirm our commitment to love all people by standing and reciting together Heidelberg Catechism, Lord's Day 40. I, I see you know we don't need to vote on that. That's good. Um, I will read the bolded uh, questions, um, and uh, if you could read together with me the answers, that would be greatly appreciated. Lord's Day 40, question and answer 105. Question. What is God's will for you in the sixth commandment? I am not to belittle, hate, insult, or kill my neighbor, not by my thoughts, my words, my look, or gesture, and certainly not by my actual deeds. And I am not to be party to this in others. Rather, I am to put away all desire for revenge. I am not to harm or recklessly endanger myself either. Prevention of murder is also why government is armed with the sword. Question and answer 106. Question, does this commandment refer only to murder? By forbidding murder, God teaches us that he hates the root of murder, envy, hatred, anger, vindictiveness. In, In God's sight, all such are disguised forms of murder. Question and answer 107. Is it enough, then, that we do not murder our neighbor in any such way? No. no. By condemning envy, hatred, and anger, God wants us to love our neighbors as ourselves, to be patient, peace-loving, gentle, merciful, and friendly toward them, to protect them from harm as much as we can, and to do good even to our enemies. Amen. I, I hate to be a stickler, but we do have to uh, move that we declare this to be our response to Overture 8. <laughs> so moved, it's before us. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? 
Motion carries. Thank you, everyone. Stay up there. Go right to 4B. Oh. Folks, we'll go right to 4B. I sense that Daniel is on a roll. <laughs> You're too kind. I have to find the report. <laughs> All right. 4B. It sounds like Battleship a little bit, doesn't it? All right. So um, the, uh, the next part of our uh, report uh, as Congregational Support Ministry number one um, is uh, with regards to Congregational Services of the Christian Reformed Church. You can see the, the, uh, the information there, uh, both on your screens if you're looking at it and on the uh, overhead behind me. And so I will... Uh, if it's acceptable, just move through these recommendations. One thing that I want you to be aware of, these may seem like routine sort of, oh, let's just cross our T's and dot our I's kind of stuff. However, please note that when we recommend that Synod commend the work of this or that agency or group, we really mean it. There are tremendous ministries happening in this church through the many agencies and ministries of this church. And we know that none of us is perfect, um, but man, God is so good and has blessed us with so many things. And see, so please don't see these as strictly routine uh, humdrum things, but rather let us celebrate them as we move through. Recommendation uh, two, this is under A, Committee for Contact with the Government, uh, and uh, that is recommendation that Synod commend the work of the Center for Public Dialogue, the public arm of the Committee for Contact with the Government. So moved. I'm, I'm going to interrupt you just a minute, Daniel. Um, I'm sorry, but I realize that as we all circled and Harold led us in prayer, um, which was very powerful, I'm not sure we ever... Uh, publicly thank the committee, although it was done from the floor. I just got a reminder of that. Mike is still here. Um, Mike, we want to make sure you know our thanks and express our thanks to the committee. Um, you heard that from the floor, but I want to say that from here, too, speaking on behalf of all of us. Uh, we thank you for your hard work, uh, and I hope you know our appreciation and our thanksgiving. So please uh, pass that along to the rest of the committee, those who have stepped out. I'm sorry for that interruption. You had just moved something. Would you do it again? So, Yeah, I won't challenge the chair on that one. Okay. But uh, yes, we move that Synod commend the work of the Center for Public Dialogue, the public arm of the Committee for Contact with the Government. A motion is before us. I see no speakers. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Moving on to disability concerns, then uh, we recommend that Synod commend the work of the Office of Disability Concerns. So moved. The motion is before us. I see no speakers. All in favor, say aye. aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Moving on then to the Office of Race Relations. Uh, we move that Synod commend the work of the Office of Race Relations. So moved. The motion is before us. I see no speakers. Are we ready to vote? All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion carries. For safe church ministry. We have two recommendations here. Um, and this is not because Safe Church is better than any of the others, uh, but just because there was something our committee wanted to highlight there. First is that we recommend that uh, Synod commend the work of the Office of Safe Church Ministry. And second, uh, can I move them together? That Synod highlight, the work, highlight for the churches the availability of many helpful resources through the Safe Church Ministry website, and it's listed there. So moved. So moved. I see no speakers. All in favor, say aye. aye. 
Any opposed? Moving then to social justice and hunger action, we also have two recommendations here and I would like to move them at the same time as well. First, that Synod commend the work of Social Justice and Hunger Action, otherwise known as the Office of Social Justice. And second, that Synod highlight for the churches the availabil availability of the free resource Changed for Life, created to provide short-term missions teams with quality materials that engage all participants and keep long-term goals in mind. The resource is available uh, through this website, which is listed there. The reason we added that was because so many of our churches, uh, young people, old people, all kinds of folks are involved in short-term missions projects, and often there's difficulty when they come back sort of crashing down to earth uh, or in sustaining that, that spiritual growth that happened there, and so we just wanted to highlight that. Thank you. So moved. I see no speakers. All in favor, say aye. aye. Any opposed? That motion carries. Moving on to urban aboriginal ministries. Uh, we, our recommendation is that Synod commend the work of urban aboriginal ministries in Canada as they bring healing, reconciliation, and restored relationships between aboriginal peoples and non-aboriginal peoples in Canada. So moved. Are we ready to vote? All in favor, say aye. aye. Any opposed? That motion carries. Moving on uh, then, uh, last, last but not least, uh, by any stretch of the imagination, uh, to Friendship Ministries, um, which report you can find on page 354 of the agenda, uh, we recommend that Synod commend the work of Friendship Ministries. Motions before us. No speakers. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion carries. Then this concludes the work of the Advisory Committee for Honorable Thank you for President. for your work. Thank you for your work. Now, before we get too excited about all of those motions we went through <laughs> uh, with no amendments or tablings or the rest, uh, let us recognize the significant ministries that they represent. Um, I think I see Esteban up there, but there might be others as well who are involved in this ministry. Uh, Bonnie, would you, would you please stand? Anyone who's involved in these ministries we've just gone through, um, please stand. Thank you so that we can recognize you for your good work. And, and again, we do, we do hope that you realize that although we sort of zoom through those recommendations quickly, that the church is deeply grateful uh, for your work. In fact, in many ways, we've already been experiencing that work here on the floor of Senate. Uh, so from the Church of Jesus Christ and particularly the Christian Reformed Church of North America, thank you so much for all your work. And thank you for your work too, Daniel and Lauren and the committee. Yeah, just a quick word, if I may. Um, just a great deal of thanks to our chair, uh, Laren Zorhoff. Um, he had a tremendous amount of uh, patience and wisdom, kindness and gentleness for us. Um, he really helped us to be a team uh, and did a fin just, a, in my opinion, a fantastic job. So really appreciate that. So um, one more quick note, and then I think what we're going to try to do, all of you should have in front of you um, from Advisory Committee 9. Um, they did some uh, quick work for us. We so recommitted to them uh, letter B of recommendation number four. Uh, I think you already have that, or if you haven't got it uh, in front of you electronically, pull it up. It's Advisory Committee 9, recommitted. Uh, that's essentially the um, appointment of the task force, or rather who will be on, what the task force will consist of. So in just a moment, I'll ask uh, um, uh, Peter and Ken to come forward and we'll, we'll move with that uh, before supper. But I did just want to give credit to uh, uh, Margarita Ritter, who made the suggestion about uh, the circle prayer time. So I don't know where you are, uh, but wherever you are, thank you for that suggestion. I found that... Uh, 
uh, very moving, and um, so I just wanted to thank you. Peter. Is everyone able to find what we're talking about? Advisory Committee 9, recommitted. Peter, if you would, just uh, read through it since it's new material. Yes. Is the vote for PKA uh, in there somewhere that's not part of this? Because I don't see it in the document. They should be able to see it electronically as a new document from Committee 9 or, or not. Well, you'll have to ask Peter about your fancy Latin. We did not amend, <clears throat> Mr. President, we you did not. Just take us through it, please, yes. So um, we're at 4B, the new 4B? Yes. Okay. The committee will be constituted by up to 12 individuals, CRC members who represent diversity in gender, ethnicity, binationality, and ministry location, and who adhere to the CRC's biblical view of marriage and same-sex relationships. These individuals will be gifted and suited for this task. Ideally, the committee will include, and then you have the same list as before, except we have decided to provide, uh, or to make two separate uh, categories there for same-sex attracted person and a gender dysphoric person to indicate these are two separate individuals. At least three ethnic minority pastors and or theologians at least three faculty members from Calvin Theological Seminary, one Old Testament, one New Testament, one philosophical, ethical, or historical theology, a same-sex attracted person, a gender dysphoric person, two pastors, a chaplain, a philosopher, a scientist. Mr. President, the grounds remain as before. I don't believe I need to read them, but just to comment about all of those categories, it's conceivable that there will be some overlap there. If you do your math, you'll see that all of those add up to 13 individuals, but we're quite hopeful that uh, a number of people will cover more than one of those categories. Right. So Peter, am I correct in saying that really in the, in the paragraph that leads up to the description, you tried to broaden and clarify who you'd be looking for? That's correct. Okay. And so, um, thank you for that. The motion is before us. Yes, I so move it, Mr. It President. is recommendation B under number four. That's where it falls. This comes in place of the recommendation B from their previous report. Everyone understands what we're doing? The motion is on the floor. Three people signed up before we started the queue. Remember, wait till the motion is on the floor. So if you're going to Get your name in, please do so. Who's the? Michael Wanowski. Thank you, Mr. President. Our class has sent an overture asking for a study committee and Synod has decided to grant that. Our overture left some space for members of that committee to disagree with the CRC's current theological and ethical positions. I thought that was a good idea. In the Reformed tradition, we are always willing to question and reconsider our own beliefs, though we do that in the light of God's word. For us, the Bible has a unique authority that determines our belief and practice. That's the commitment we all reaffirmed as synod convened. As I've listened to the debate here at Synod, my confidence in the integrity of that commitment has been eroded. I don't remember the exact words, but I think I heard a fellow pastor say that the only definition of marriage the Bible offers is loving, faithful commitment to your partner, whoever that may be. 
And I want to say, really? I'm used to hearing that in coffee shops and classrooms. I didn't expect to hear that on the floor of synod. Not from a person called to tell the truth of God's word. Not from a church that wants to tell the world the truth. That's what I think is at stake today. Will we together as a denomination tell the truth of God's word to ourselves, to our children, to the world God loves? In order to speak God's truth faithfully, we need to listen to it like this. Not like this. I speak in favor of the motion, Mr. President. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna, I'd like to say this. I have more names on the list than I can count. We've already discussed this for quite a while. So follow Michael's example and keep your comments to two minutes. We're going to start timing right now. All right? Lots of people want to talk to this. I get that. But be succinct and get to your point as quickly as possible. John and then Jack. John Maidendorf, Classes Huron. I have uh, two notes and then a comment. Um, the first note is that uh, this list uh, consists of 13 individuals. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Um, second, I would just like to note, I don't want to make a motion, uh, I would just like to note that there's no recommendation for any uh, youth or young adults to be represented on this committee. You want to speak to that, Peter? Or, or... It is our hope, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, that um, the individuals who are listed here in these categories would convey the sentiments, the feelings, the beliefs of the youth and young adults in our churches that we did not need to specifically have such a person serve on the committee. Thank you. Um, third, I would like to just address um, the mandate calls for the members of the committee to adhere to the CRC's biblical view on marriage and same-sex relationships. And I don't have anything against that per se, um, but what I am concerned about is that that's maybe being used as a litmus test to close the conversation on one end without closing it on the other end. Uh, the Christian Reformed Church's 1973 position is more than simply a statement that uh, gay sex is against uh, scripture. Uh, the 1973 position of the Christian Reformed Church also states that people who experience same-sex attraction are created in the image of God. It states that the gospel is for them as much as it is for anybody. And it states that our gay and lesbian brothers and sisters in Christ ought to be fully embraced in the life of the church. And the reason this concerns me uh, the reason the restraints in the committee concern me um, is that they do nothing to ensure that the members hold to the fullness and richness of our 1973 position. And there are compelling reasons for concern here because if we look at the results of the survey conducted by the study committee, we see that there are widely held views in this denomination on both sides of 1973. On page 412 of the Synod agenda, is that the two minute warning? Yep, your time okay. is up, John. Well, there's a lot of people who think that being gay is a sin, and I just want to know how the committee is going to Thank ensure you, John. that people hold to the full I appreciate position. that. Jack, and then Bill, and then Paul. Jack, Bill, Viz, Paul. Nope, take Jack's off. Bill, and then Paul. Mr. Chairman, I want to call the question, and then just a note about why. Uh, we've already recommitted this once. Uh, they've done their best. It will cut off any possibility of amendment. I just want to call the question to test the body if that's their desire. All right, again, we've done this multiple times. You know what call the question means. If you don't want that, vote against it, all right? Question's been called, yes, Chris? Winter, Classes Niagara. Point of order question. Uh, before we uh, moved to recommit, we approved a motion to amend for the uh, promoter fee day. When that goes to recommit, is that amendment then dismissed? Or, and as Not dismissed, but we recommitted it to the committee to consider. 
we assumed, Mr. Mr. Chair, that that had been accepted. Uh, it wasn't in the document that we had. We assumed that we had adopted that or accepted that earlier in the discussion. I, I thought we had. Right. So, so you are considering that yes, a part. You yes. just don't have it in there. Yes, exactly. Okay. Does that make sense to you, Chris? It does. It just seems that it would have been represented in the makeup of the committee. That's okay. So, Thank you. so, and that goes to the earlier question that uh, that you were asking as well, Daniel. Thank. Really Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. The question's been called. All in favor of calling the question, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? That motion carries. Paul is up next, and then Matthew. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. President. I had um, two questions, really, for clarification. I'm, I'm guessing this is going to go forward, and so I'm trying to get a sense of what the committee is hoping for from recommendations of people. The first question I had was around the promoter fide or whatever clarified. Second question, chaplain is an ambiguous category in the Christian Reformed Church. And uh, because we have those in chaplaincy care ministries who work in institutions like hospitals, military, um, et cetera, and there's also, and we've been using it every once in a while, campus ministers who work on universities chaplain. I, what, what are you hoping for from that word or either? It could, Mr. President, it could be either one, but since we've heard from a number of campus ministers who have spoken on this, the likelihood is I would expect that that would be a campus pastor, but perhaps not. Yeah, okay. I just wondered if you... That's great. Clarification. Thank you. Um, the second point of clarification, as I was reading it, and it's kind of come up already, I, I was interested in your use of the word adhere and what you meant by it. Because, I mean, some of us adhere to what the president says and the rules of synodical procedure, but we don't always agree. So I just wondered what you meant so that we send you the right people. We knew, Mr. President, this would generate a lot of discussion. So our sense or our understanding of it here is that committee members will stick to the positions of our denomination as related to uh, marriage and same-sex relationships with the understanding that they will have openness to consider other options. In fact, the earlier uh, decisions that we've made suggest that we will have exactly those discussions and the uh, uh, other uh, individual, the uh, not the defense or fide, the protector fide, I think that was the terminology. I know, it's uh, all Latin to me. That's right. Uh, that person will ensure that these kind of conversations do in fact take place on that committee. So adhere, stick to it with openness, with curiosity, with the possibility that minds may be changed. That's really helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Matthew's up. Matt Ackerman, Classes Lake Erie. Uh, I submitted an amendment that was deemed not friendly, and I would have loved to have submitted it now, but I can't because the question's been called. Uh, side note, I'm a little disturbed that we are reducing discussion on importance that are this Im on matters that are this important to our denomination. I know that we're tired, and I know that we've done a lot in this synod, but this stuff matters, and we should have the right to talk about it. We should be able to get into these things. That being said, I would love to have this committee reflect a diverse makeup of study committee members that will serve well to ensure a variety of perspectives and expertise. That's the grounds that you offered. I completely support that. And I hesitate to bring this up because I'm sitting right next to them and I have the utmost respect for them. But three Calvin Seminary profs from one institution, it's like three people from one classes or one congregation. There's a, a limiting of diversity viewpoints, and we have a number of higher institutions that we're affiliated with as a denomination from other geographic parts of our denomination that might provide a little more diversity of perspective. I have the utmost respect for our seminary and its professors. That was what I would have amended had I the opportunity. I think my two minutes is probably up. Thanks. Cedric is up, and then Lee. And then Chris. Please be ready to speak, Lee and then Chris after Cedric. He's on my side. Um, Cedric Parcells, class is Granville. Uh, I want to speak in favor of uh, the motion. Uh, I think uh, it shows our committee uh, did a great job. Um, <clears throat> I will, however, I'm assuming that the promoter fide piece is somewhere included in there. Um, honestly, I, I don't know why it's there. It seems really unnecessary to me. The promoter fide is a Roman Catholic creation for the canonization of saints. Um, and um, 
in addition to the fact that the committee is already being asked to dialogue with untraditional opinions and to discuss them and to lay out how a reformed hermeneutic might be compatible or incompatible with them. So I, I think the whole thing's a little strange, but nevertheless, I, I really like what you guys have done and I hope we uh, can move quickly through this. Thank you. Lee and then Chris. Lee Kong, Classes Holland. A few weeks ago, uh, a young lady had uh, approached me in my church, and she asked me, is uh, homosexuality a sin? Uh, now, according to the report that came out regarding uh, same-sex marriage, um, because I come from an ethnic immigrant background, uh, I basically have nothing positive to say uh, or, or to add to this conversation. And that's probably true. I mean, I'm a sinful human being. I'm broken, just like the rest of us uh, in this room. So whatever I say out of my own brokenness would probably be flawed and maybe even hurtful. But you see, that's the amazing thing about the gospel, right? In Jesus Christ, God transforms this mess of a person so that I can speak into the lives of, of bro other broken people. And believing that the gospel changes and transforms lives, I said to this young lady, whether or not I believe that homosexuality is wrong, that's besides the point. The point is what Scripture, God's Word, says about homosexuality. And what began to happen was we opened up God's Word and we began to discuss matters of human fallenness and what that means to be created in the image of God. And then we began to talk about how God so loved this world that he gave his only son to die for our sins. And I know I don't need to tell you guys this. You're all pastors and elders and deacons. You know this. But why do I tell this story? Why Their time is up. I speak in favor of the motion. I... Chris and Jan, and I would like to remind you, to, I, I realize we've limited it to two minutes, questions already been called, but please speak to the motion. The motion is the makeup of the committee. Chris, Jan, Chris is off, Jan, and then Andrew. Jan Van Vliet, class is Iacota. I'm an economist, apparently it doesn't matter, I can't count, we're now up to 13, so the number doesn't matter. But can I direct my question? Sure. Um, could you define for me what you mean by scientist? We, Mr. President, we intentionally left that open because we realized there are a number of different uh, areas in the scientific uh, inquiries that could prove to be very helpful here. So we gen intentionally left that open. So this could be a social scientist? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Andrew and then Joel. Mics are always too low, and I don't know why. Andrew Zorman, class is Hamilton. Um, I had the pleasure of serving on this committee. I'm in favor of this motion. Um, a great diverg divergence of opinion of the people in the room, but able to come to a common consensus, Mr. Chair. Um, the committee has done well, I believe, up to this point, um, coming with a, with a unified report. And uh, I, I would just ask that the body continue to let us seek to find a way forward as, as we seek to bless the church. I think we're, we're, we're attempting to do our best. We recognize there is work to be done. And uh, I, I think this will hopefully allow us to be able to, uh, to, to do that in a helpful way. I speak in favor of the motion, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Joel and then Daniel. Joel Zeidema, Ileana. Uh, for the sake of transparency and to make sure that I can vote for this motion, I want a little clarification on the phrase and who adhere to the CRC's biblical view on marriage and same-sex relationships. How do you go about, we set a process whereby we compose study committees. How is this going to be found out? Will you be asking these questions as names are submitted? Do you call people back? Do you say, here we are in our denomination's position. Do you submit to that or not? It, how does it go? Please. Mr. President, I believe that uh, when 
specific individuals will be consulted and asked whether they wish to serve on this committee, that is a question that we will put to them that will determine their uh, legitimacy, for lack of a better word, for serving in this role. Thank you. And I remind you that after we act on this motion, we still need to appoint the committee. We do have up to two weeks after Senate, and then the officers have to do it, but we need names gathered by the committee as well, so don't forget that process. Daniel, and then Brian. Is Brian next? Brian's next. Um, I'll just speak in favor of the motion. I'm um, very happy to see um, that what the Bible says is of the most importance, um, and I'm encouraged to see what will come of this. Daewoo Park, and then Sam Lee after Daewoo. Mr. President, uh, <clears throat> I'm speaking in favor of of this motion. So I'm so happy to see that what I see in this motion is uh, very, very conservative and the biblical is saying, and we, this is contains of what I need. So I want to ask Charles Kim to transfer, translate for better understanding. Great. Sure. 우리 노예는 다양한 문화를 가진 교회들로 구성되어 있습니다. 그리고 우리 교단은 약 20%가 소수민족으로 구성되어 있어요. 또 이런 다양성은 한국을 비롯한 동남아시아, 아프리카 교회를 포함하고 부유하거나 가난한 교회, 또 도시 혹은 시골 교회 등을 다 포함하고 있습니다. I'm part of a classes that's very diverse. And from my understanding, uh, we have at least 20% of our denomination made up of many ethnic groups, especially over 100 Korean churches. This diversity can only be united as we understand the scripture and what it says about our own sexuality. Uh, I know there's varying groups, uh, whether socioeconomic to cultural, and many different types of uh, differences we share. However, we're looking forward to what scripture has to say to unite us together. 우리는 글로벌 다양성을 추구하는 교단인데 다양한 목소리를 정확하게 들을 필요가 있습니다. 왜냐하면 우리의 표준은 이 북미주, 노스 아메리카에 해당되는 것뿐만 아니라 글로벌 스탠다드에 맞춰야 하기 때문인 줄 저는 그렇게 믿습니다. 그래서 이이 모션은 이런 모든 것들을 다 포함하고 있어서 저는 적극적으로 지지합니다. Uh, I know that we are uh, looking to uh, understand what the scripture will say, but also will have a global implication as some of the ethnic churches are still connected to the churches where we're from. And I am very relieved to see, at least at the this study committee will include ethnic minority leaders and their voices to be included. So I am in big favor of this motion. Thank you. Thank you. Sam and Ashley. And that concludes the list. Sam and then Ashley. Sam Lee, uh, Classes GLA. Uh, I have two questions uh, for, the, for the chair. Um, of the committee, um, I was just wondering. I'm, I'm actually speaking for this motion, but what? Um, I just see that there are a lot of clergies. But is there? Uh, is there? Uh, have you guys considered? I, I was just wondering why you haven't considered uh, uh, in the in the church in the church uh, laity uh, from minority or or any laity members who might not be same sex attracted uh, members of the. Yes, uh, Mr. President, uh, <clears throat> we certainly want to strive for a balance um, and diversity among clergy and non-clergy. However, our committee felt that the work of this uh, proposed study committee required a great deal of theological input, and that mm -hmm. is the reason for the professors and the uh, clergy component. Yeah, I just, I, just thought, I just thought maybe a practical angle from uh, laity might, might you know, from their perspective might add to or, or, or enrich the input of this study. We so certainly hope that, that will question. be a part of it. 
And second question is to uh, the president. I was, I, I don't know if you could actually ask for a motion after this is voted, but if I could, I just wanted to, you know, uh, make a motion to uh, uh, give our deep gratitude and appreciation to Advisory Committee 9 for, for what, what they've done extra hours of work that they put in, and, and perhaps if there's a budget for it, give every members of Advisory Committee 9 a seat upgrade on their way home. <laughs> or if they, if they live here locally, give them like $50 gift cards to Best Buy or... <laughs> Just a motion, thank you. All right, then. Very friendly. Maybe John Bolt can get out his credit card and take care of that during the break. We had someone else. I lost my place. Ashley. Thank you. Um, Ashley Boots, my young adult rep. It's a little bit terrifying being the last person to speak. Um, but I do acknowledge that the question's been called. And if it hadn't been called, I couldn't even make an amendment. Um, and I also don't have a vote. That being said, at this list, this list, um, I see two possible people that could be young adults on this committee going by the 18 to 25 year. Um, and so the answer that was given that hopefully the role and the voice of the young adult given by somebody else just doesn't make sense to me. Um, and so where's the voice of the young adult? We're not gonna get that in a 50 plus or, well, technically 25 plus if we're going by age here. Um, and so now I don't know what to do about that because we're, we've called the question. And so I think that we've really lost that in this committee. Thank you. The motion is before us. Are we ready to vote? All in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Motion carries. Then I believe we are to 4C, Mr. President. Yes. The recommendation that was added related to the proposed timeline. Yes. Would you like me to read that? Do we have that, the, the proposed timeline that we added? Who, who made that amendment? That was a friendly amendment. Chris Goon right? from Hamilton. Just as, uh, as they're paging through the papers and looking for the electronic copy, you all remember that earlier today uh, we added a proposed timeline giving one extra year to the study committee over the standards so that they were going to report back in 2021. 2021. And an interim report in 2019. Right. Yes. It, it, it was, but we, we had to add it to the report. We still need to vote on it. It wasn't part of this recommendation. That Senate provide, I'm reading it here, that Senate provide the study committee with a five-year window to com complete their task so that the committee will present their final report to Senate 2021. With this extended time frame, a written summary of the committee's work will be provided by February 1, 2019 for inclusion in the agenda of Senate 2019 in order for Senate 2019 to dialogue with and provide feedback to the committee. And the grounds, the scope of the task assigned to the committee needs more time to be completed than the typical three-year window allows. The consideration of status confessionalness is a weighty matter that requires extended and careful deliberation. I so move, Mr. President. 
It's moved and it is on the floor in front of us. So essentially it says we're gonna give this study committee a little more time to do its work and a little larger feedback loop for Senate. Marley Littner. Marley Littner, um, Classes Columbia. Um, in the last five years, we've, um, we've gone from uh, not even thinking that uh, same-sex marriage would be possible to having it uh, legalized throughout the, the whole North American continent. Five years is a very, very long time, so I'm, I'm, I'm not in favor of this motion. Next up is Derek. Derek. Derek Bukema, class of Chicago South. I'm wondering if it wouldn't be wise to hear from uh, one or a couple of our faculty advisors who might speak to the mandate and the scope of it and might be able to tell us if it would be wiser to ask for, for three years as is normal or five years. Would that be wise? Do any of our faculty advisors want to speak to that, what they think of this timeline? Kathy will. Thank you. Kathy Smith, faculty advisor, I'll just say one thing, that given the decision earlier this week to move the date for distribution of reports up, um, five years is really effectively four years. The reports have to be out by September 15. They're gonna have to be in a month to six weeks ahead of that for editing. So five years is really four years. Any, any length of years, cut one off. I got it. Seminary professors ought to think of that when they assign paper deadlines, don't you think? <laughs> I, mean, I have Mr. Gina. President, uh, that was that was from I think that was from my committee. We did not make a decision to change the deadline. We referred that question to the Synod Review Task Force. Thanks for the clarification, Bob. Gina, and then Joan. Gina Taylor, Classes Hamilton, I would like to call the question. Gina calls the question. You know what that means. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Joan, you just got in. Ah, there we go. We are ready to vote on the motion in front of us. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Motion carries. That moves us to recommendation five, Mr. President. That Synod declare this to be its response to overtures 15 through 37 and overture 38, found in the supplement, communications three and four. I so move. Motion is in front of us. Is there any discussion? I don't see any. Are we ready to vote? All in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? That motion carries. Peter? Yes, you, uh, Mr. President, referred earlier to the possibility of having two weeks for individuals to be appointed to a study committee. It's very likely that our committee will need that much time, the officers of the committee with the officers of Synod. So I would just like to uh, take this opportunity to remind delegates that we would love to have names of individuals who could potentially serve on this new study committee as soon as you have them, but there is a little bit of time. It does not need to be done as is preferable and often the case um, when Synod concludes. All right. So please, if you have names, suggest them uh, to the committee. We did not know when we would conclude this committee's work, of course, and Peter very graciously um, said, let's have a prayer, and I know we're going to pray just in a moment to, uh, before we go to dinner, um, but we want to remember that what we've been talking about is not just a doctrinal issue, it's not just a biblical issue, it's a pastoral issue that involves real people. Of course, most of what we talk about involves real people, but this also involves a deep level of pain. And much like we prayed after the uh, Doctrine of Discovery question, we want to recognize 
uh, those who really wrestle with this and struggle with this and are hurt by this. And so Peter has offered uh, a, a moment of, or to have a prayer uh, just in recognition of that, and he's prepared that. Please pray with me. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we have seen last night and again today how your church struggles here on earth, how we struggle to be communities that embody the presence of our Lord Jesus, communities full of grace and truth. We confess that we are a broken body, that we don't wrestle enough sometimes with topics that often confuse us, many of which are matters of pastoral urgency and require deep sensitivity. We confess that in our holy pursuit to be doctrinally right and faithful to Scripture, we so often fail to love, to love all people. Lord, more than 40 years ago, the synod of this denomination recommended that those who identify within themselves a same-sex attraction are to be wholeheartedly received by the Church as persons for whom Christ died that the Church must exercise the same patient understanding of and holy compassion for them as for all other sinners, that they, like all Christians, are called to discipleship and to the employment of their gifts in the cause of the kingdom, that they are fellow servants of Christ who are to be given opportunity to render within the offices and structures of congregations the same service that is expected from others. Forgive us, Lord, for not living up to that or sometimes not even being interested in pursuing those goals. Show us how to do it, Lord. Fill us with your Holy Spirit who guides into all truth and who makes our Christian witness clear and compelling and attractive. Remind us, Lord, as we attempt to discern the differences between righteousness and unrighteousness, that we should avoid at all cost the ease with which we so often fall into self-righteousness which is really just another form of unrighteousness and is in fact one of its most subtle and dangerous manifestations. Lord Jesus, when you walked this earth, the religiously respectable were repeatedly outraged by the kind of company you kept. May it not be so with us. Show us again and always that the burden of discipleship is no heavier for others than it is for us that the demands of obedience to you are equally placed on us all, no matter who we are. We thank you, God, for the power of the gospel, the good news that announces that we are accepted by you. Thank you that the gospel is not a word that tells us how we must change before we can receive your love, but is a word that declares we are loved by you completely and eternally, that it is a word of power that invites us to live out the change that you alone can accomplish. Lord Jesus, Lord of the Church, friend of sinners, thank you for walking with us, for receiving our worship, and for claiming as disciples all who struggle to follow you. We pray in your strong and blessed name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Peter, and thanks to the committee. I need you to listen real carefully. I know we're already uh, uh, late for our dinner, but um, we are going into executive session immediately following dinner. We have an appeal. You do not have any materials in front of you for that appeal yet because it's confidential. You will have paper copies uh, as you return from dinner. So. We will be going into executive session. It's difficult for me to predict how long that will take. If it only takes us a half hour, an hour, um, we will do more business after that executive session is over. If it takes us two hours, I don't know if at 9 o'clock I'm going to try to get us to shift gears to another weighty matter. So uh, we'll just have to take that as it comes. Uh, An executive session, I want to make sure we get this right because this is now a matter of appeal it, uh, and it's very sensitive. Um, here, I'm just reading straight out of the rules now. In such sessions, only the delegates, the staff consultants, the seminary advisors, the president and one other member of the executive committee of the board of trustees 
and such others as determined by Senate upon the recommendation of the executive director shall be present. And I don't believe we have any others that need to be present. So if delegates from fully recognized churches and ecclesiastical fellowship are at Senate, they also may remain. That's what executive session is. We will be going into that immediately at seven tonight. As you arrive this evening, there will be material related to that. Please remember the confidential nature of it all. Yes. Uh, to, uh, uh, we're going to meet in the corner by the piano. I'm, I'm going to play music for them. So immediately, okay. at, immediately after this session. Committee 9 by the piano. Joe is going to offer our prayer for going to dinner. I know we already had a prayer, but we got a, uh, Joe is up to pray uh, to bless our, our dinner. I'll just do it from here. So. <clears throat> Please give your attention to Joe and the prayer for dinner. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we have heard a lot of things this afternoon, and uh, we have done some deliberating, and we have some deliberating to do. And so, Lord, as we go to this meal, we pray that you will uh, nourish us, nourish us body and soul, so that when we come back here and we hear this appeal, that we will have the wisdom and the ability to be able to respond with appropriate grace and truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.